a checklist for Teams Voice Success. And what I want to do is quickly go through these things. This is what we've found. If you do these things, you have a very high probability of having your migration to Teams be successful. Some of these are uh, self-evident, like for example, define success. This seems simple, but unfortunately many organizations uh, don't seem to do this. Um, and it really is around figuring out uh, measurable reasons and what is success gonna look like for you. It could be cost savings, but then you have to define you know, how much you're trying to save over what period of time. Maybe it's not about cost savings, but more it's about user experience. Okay, how, you know, do you measure it? Do you know what the user experience is pre and post? Um, it could be about increased productivity. That's sometimes tough because a lot of organizations in a lot of roles are measuring productivity, but you know, certainly you can benchmark it and you know, decide how to measure it. The key about defining the success criteria is really you know, you're going to have to make some trade-off decisions uh, and evaluate some options. And this allows you to have the criteria to decide the right uh, you know, trade-off decisions as you go forward. You know, you need to know where you are. This sounds simple, but um, you know, if your legacy voice system has grown up over time, a lot of times you end up with DIDs and potentially multiple offices. You're not exactly sure what they're used or if they're, uh, you know, still in use. Um, you know, and, and a whole bunch of things to map out and to do this this work ahead of time. You know, boss admin scenarios, reception, and how are you dealing with after hours training, or handling. Uh, call pickup groups, you know, what analog devices do you require or are currently in use, and paging and IVR flows and lobby phones. So there's a bunch of just, you know, documenting the current state that does require some effort, um, but you need to do that in order to have the successful migration. But then you need to evaluate your options, and a key takeaway is, you know, you shouldn't necessarily try to do like for like. Teams provides a whole bunch of voice capabilities, uh, but some of the things work differently. So if you are really rigid and try to do like for like, um, that sometimes is is problematic, and it also sometimes doesn't provide the the best user experience. There's now you know three PSTN voice options. A key message that I want you to you know leave today with is you can combine these. I find a lot of organizations think they have to pick one of these. So we have this new operator connect. Um, you know, where uh, the enterprise chooses a service provider, it's done through the Teams Admin Center, um, but it's not quite as simple yet as, you know, I think it's going to be. Then you have direct routing um, where you can have an on-premises SBC. Greg's going to talk a little bit more about how this is interconnected, or it can be uh, direct routing as a service. Right now, 87% of organizations are using this. And I think, you know, we'll talk about why and some of the flexibility there. This is one of the options that allows you to, uh, with, for example, SIP trunking, use concurrent channels as opposed to per user uh, pricing. And, you know, there's a big financial savings for certainly for larger organizations. Or you can just have Microsoft be your uh, service provider, about 13%, mostly smaller organizations, uh, use that very simple to set up, but it doesn't really scale well from a financial perspective. One of the things for success that organizations unfortunately don't really think about is consider the interim. So to get to the end, imagine you're going from the you know fishbowl on the left to the fishbowl on the right. You know, a lot of people think of the end destination, but they don't realize, especially for large organizations, that you need to manage through the middle. So there's gonna be a point where maybe you have thousands of users on the legacy system, thousands of users on the new system, and you do have to be able to manage through that, that period of time because if you're a large organization, um, you're not gonna do a flash cut. You may as well actually decide there's valid reasons to continue to operate in this hybrid mode where maybe there are some you know, users that you choose to leave on the legacy PBX or maybe some devices. So uh, in your solution, maybe there's always some fish in, in both bowls, but you have to think about how you're gonna manage through that. Certainly understand your legal requirements. Uh, I'm not gonna go into detail around how to do this, but 
you know, you've got Kerry's law where you can't, you know, you, there, you can't require people to dial nine before to get an outside line before dialing 911. But also you have to provide notification to designated personnel when 911 is dialed. So it, it, it may turn out that, you know, your legacy PBX is not actually in compliance with this right now, especially from the notification perspective. And then there's Ray Bombs Act, um, which requires you to provide a dispatchable location for all 911 calls. And that's a validated, not only street address, but in larger buildings, um, you know, suite, apartment, uh, floor, uh, the, the quadrant in the floor, and, and, and it varies by jurisdiction, but certainly understand and plan for these, these legal requirements. And the good news is uh, teams, uh, either by itself or with, uh, you know, different ecosystem add-ons, certainly can meet all these requirements um, you know, not only in the U.S., but also in, in different uh, geographies and jurisdictions. Also, you really need to engage the right team. So that includes expertise and experience. And I mentioned the 270 million monthly active users, like that's a big market. And so we're seeing a lot of new vendors come in and that's terrific. And some of these vendors are bringing some, some great new capabilities from a device perspective. But certainly, um, you know, we found having experience uh, working with partners um, and devices that have been in the ecosystem for a period of time definitely increases the likelihood of success. And also keep in mind that it's both a technical project, but non-technical skills are important. So, you know, change management, communications and training is certainly one of the key components uh, that lead to a positive voice enablement with Microsoft Teams. And also plan for the long term. So while you're dealing with figuring out how you're going to design and do the migration, make sure as well that you're establishing an ongoing management process, that you're upskilling your IT staff as required, um, and making sure that there's a process for IT to track changes because, you know, there's hundreds of changes uh, that, you know, teams as it's rapidly improving, uh, they're introducing, so it's important that your IT uh, tracks that because they may in, impact the voice experience. So provide ongoing training, both for the end users in terms of how to get the most out of teams, but also for your IT pros. And then, of course, make sure that as new people come into your organization, the team's voice training uh, is incorporated into your onboarding. <clears throat> 